Um, a bit different than going into the first game. As you know, it was a challenge going into the first game with a lot of late arrivals and we'd have minimum training time. These three days off that first game has actually been really, really good for us. Um, we had a time to do a lot of tactical reviews, um, had some meetings with players, going through everything from Asian Cup review to review of the New Zealand game. And then uh, this pre-training session that we had, I just gathered a group and said it was one of the best pre-training sessions that we have actually have had in terms of the, the tempo, the quality, the energy. Um, so we always talk about getting one day better, and today we definitely got one day better. So if we can bring that quality from the training session today out to the pitch tomorrow, I think we'll see a good game. As always, we will go to the reporters in the room first, and then we'll head to the Zoom. Isabel Coots. I guess what changes in this game heading in? I mean, obviously the, it was 1-0 in the 90th minute, so what changes this time are you going to make? Um, I actually hope that there's not too much change because I think we played really, really good. Yes, I know we were down 1-0, but I think the way we played didn't really match that result at the time. Uh, what we have looked at, though, is, is converting the chances that we create. You know, to put them away earlier, we could have been 3-4-0 to four nil up in half time if we look at the chances that we create. So if we can play the same type of attack in football but convert our chances, I think we'll be in, in a better place. But we also need to be, be humble enough and, and realise that this is a new game, uh, a new challenge. New Zealand probably took some learning from the first game as well and may throw something else at us and, and we need to adjust to that and be humble enough to say this is a new game now, take the good stuff but also some learnings from that first one and do it even better tomorrow. You're a stats man, so what did the stats tell you about uh, or Friday's game in Townsville that kind of, yeah, it's an area you guys need to change going into this game? Yeah, you, you always try to merge the subjective analyze. You know, the ice is sometimes the best tool to analyze things, but then you back that up with everything from GPS data when it comes to physical performance, but also some tactical data. Um, if you look at the amount of times our attack led into final third entries, it's the best we ever had throughout my 12 months with the team. We had almost 90% of our attack going into the final third, which is definitely not normal uh, from an international standpoint as well. So that was really good. The amount of chances we created as well, but mostly so the variation of how we created the chances. We had center combination more than we had before. Uh, we had transition moment. We had when we broke them down with a lot of longer passing sections. And then as always, we are really, really tough to deal with on set plays. And that's also what won us the game, that corner. I guess one of the things that was a criticism of the Asian Cup was that you guys were going so direct to Sam, and then obviously it's nice to see that you guys are kind of having that combination play and moving the ball around. I guess is is it nice to see that the girls are looking for other options and taking that advice on board? It, it is, and, and it's not that we all of a sudden started that after the Asian Cup, because we actually started that in the Brazil camp when we had the Brazil on home ground. If you look at that first game you see much more building up from the back you see more combination play that also resulted in some nice goals against Brazil and um, if you look at the US camp those last 30 minutes of the first game against US we did the same we played really really so this spurts of it but not a 90 minutes performance and I think some nerves kicked in the Asian Cup in second half against Korea when we went too much direct and that's a natural human response when the nerves hit you you, you want to keep it simple so we review that and say, we have, if we have confidence and do our game plan and trust what we do all the way through, it will pay off. And it did against New Zealand because we played our combination game all the way through and it paid off. Have we had a couple of questions? Yeah, uh, you touched on having a bit more time uh, in the preparation for this to do some tactical review and even some Asian Cup review stuff. I'm just on the, the Asian Cup review stuff that you've been through. Mm -hmm. what, what are a couple of the key themes from that, uh, from that, that in that review that you sort of were talking about with the players? It was a long meeting. I tried, to, I tried to, to keep it short. I know I can talk too much at times uh, and way too fast as well. And then I swear too much when I get excited. <laughs> anyway, I tried to keep it short. Uh, the, the key takeaway was one, we have a, had a very challenging lead into the tournament with seven COVID cases over Christmas. And we had 12 players playing zero minutes for three and a half weeks leading into it. So our form wasn't the best. And it's not it's an excuse. It's just we're looking at the physical data as well. So for example, in that Korea game, we had a 45% reduction on high, sprint, high speed runs in that second half. And you know how we want to play. We want to be aggressive, we want to run a lot, and we couldn't do that in that second half. It was a midday game with heat, and we were a little bit underdone coming into the tournament, and we need to manage to play. So that's one takeaway. That means we need to do a lot of prep work going into the World Cup to be in fit and in form and available. 
The second one was what I just talked about in terms of the belief in how we play, even if it's a quarterfinal and a do or die game, to have that trust in what we're doing, because we had some really good moments in the first half against Korea. But I think in the second half that the stress hits us a bit and we didn't really stay loyal to, to what we did. But the other thing we actually looked at was the amount of chances we actually created that we played well, but also that we didn't convert. And games are won and lost inside the 18, especially in tournaments. And the final thing we looked at was set plays. We had 14-2 in scores on set plays, meaning we scored 14 and conceded two. But the two we conceded was a late one against Thailand with lack of game management from our side, and we need to learn on that. And then it was a free kick from the wide area that actually Korea scored for. Yes, they played short, but it was from a free kick in the wide area. So those set plays is also an important learning. So those were the three main takeaways. Oh. Yeah, and just in terms of um, if you keep that the World Cup as the sort of the end goal, the thing you're always working towards on tomorrow night's game, what are you know a couple of the things you just want to see? Just, just take another step towards that end goal of the World Cup. Keep doing what we're doing, but doing even faster. We always talk about how fast can we play because the international game today just gets faster and faster and faster. So even if we have some combination plays and we move the ball good, we need to do it faster. So it's how fast can we play. That's one thing that I want to see tomorrow. The other one I want to see is I think we got away at times in our defending when we weren't really 100% focused and we can be hurt against the top nations in the world. If you're not 100% focused in every single second off the ball, you can get hurt. So I want to see a little bit better focus in the defensive side of the game tomorrow. Okay. Not, th not that we were bad defensively, but you know that la lack of concentration for a 30 seconds could cost you a goal at international level. And I want us to train that 90 minute focus on, on defending side of things as well. Thank you. Caitlin? Uh, you all got a, a chance to train out there today. Uh, what are your thoughts on the pitch here? Hey, it's interesting you asked that question because I spoke to the goalkeeper coach when I came on to the, to the field and said, this is World Cup standard. This is one of the best fields we, we've been at. It's amazing. And I think that's also a reason why the pre-training session was so good. Obviously, the focus and the players contribute to it, but the pitch as well. So we can definitely play fast tomorrow because you saw in training today that the pitch is phenomenal. Nine long years since uh, the Matildas have been here in Canberra. Are you hoping that um, we get plenty of support out here for the girls tomorrow? Yeah, and you know what? We already feel that support. It's been amazing since we arrived. Everything from the airport to the hotel and then the, the fan training yesterday when we have an open session when they were there um, cheering us on as well. So I can't wait to, to get here tomorrow and, and have that feeling. And I've said that from day one. We're doing this together leading into the World Cup. It's not just about the 90-minute football on the field. It's what's happening in the stands and around as well. We, we do this together. We'll take some questions from the Zoom now. We'll start it with Michael Lynch, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, good question. Um, I think being a head coach in this job, there's always going to be criticism. It's a part of the elite sport. And I think, honestly, I actually like a debate on whether a player should play or not or a different formation and such. That debate, I think, is healthy. Uh, there's always going to be opinion that another player should play or play a different formation and such. Uh, th that, I think, is healthy. It just needs to be fair and educated, those comments, and, and, and be educated on what we're doing. Um, I've said it from day one that one of the things that was identified uh, before I even came was the results against top-ranked nations. Uh, I shared that stats with media way back in November in a roundtable talk. And, and if you look from 2011 to 2020, those 10 years, and you look only at tournament games against top-ranked nations, you will see really bad stats, to be really frank and honest here. The stats are really bad for us. So we said we need to play those top nations more to be prepared next time we play them. Um, and that means the results in those friendlies might not match the expectations, because statistically the expectations have been that we win a lot of games, but we have played too many low-ranked teams in the past, in my opinion, to be prepared for tournaments. So I'm ready to take that criticism because I believe in that process so much. The other thing that I've tried to do is to connect to that gap report. Uh, if you read that, the Federation came up with a gap report about fringe players that we need to have more players getting exposure to the national team. The average amount of debutants in this national team for a decade before I came on board was 2.4 players in average. Last year we debutant 14 players. So 
debit 14 players and at the same time have the toughest schedule ever in the history of this program, I think it's natural that sometimes the result won't be, be brilliant. And I'm not saying this to protect myself because I take ownership of those results. Uh, I'm just saying it's a part of a bigger process and a bigger journey. But I've also been very clear that what happened in 21 is not going to happen in 22 because we're too close to the World Cup right now. So we can't keep having those amounts of debutants anymore. doesn't mean the door is closed. I'm always going to bring in the place I think is best for the team. But you're going to see more continuity in the lineups moving forward to prepare for the uh, World Cup. Follow up, Michael? Joey Lynch. Um, thanks, sir. Hi, Tony. Um, hope you're well. Um, I hope you enjoyed the deep dive with my colleague Ante last night. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you touched on it there, working on your defence. Obviously, if form holds true from the previous game, New Zealand aren't exactly doing a lot to test your defence in these two programs. So how can you work on that and take some defensive positives from this series as a result? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. First of all, I said I actually enjoyed last night a lot with Ante. It was a really good uh, communication by two football maniacs that love to talk football and dig deep into tactics. And you always learn from uh, communication and meetings with people. So I actually took some learnings yesterday as well and, and grow as a coach and learn things about our game. It's always interesting. We have people from the outside looking at us and... and Sometimes it's an eye-opener, sometimes it's just, you know, it's a really good meeting. So that, that's first. Second one, in terms of, of the defending side, like I said, I think there were parts in that game on Friday where we didn't do the things we need to do defensively, but we wasn't hurt by it. But if that, and, and this, with all, I, I'm not saying this to disrespect New Zealand in any way, but it's obviously different to play a U.S., and, and if you get exposed against you know, top-ranked players and top-ranked teams, you can get hurt. So you need to create those good habits. No matter who you play, you have to have that, those good habits. But what I say, though, is New Zealand have scored on us on both occasions. When we played in the Olympics they, uh, and, and also now. So we need to be humble enough to say, you know what? We need to stay loyal to our principles defensively uh, and be even better than we were on Friday to not concede it, to be able to keep a clean sheet. Because that's what we want to do at the end of the day. Follow up, Joey. No, we'll go to Marco. Great, Tony. You were just saying before that the team needs to play, you know, high-ranked nations, um, the, the, you know, the best nations to prepare for the World Cup. With uh, New Zealand not being a high-ranked nation, what's what's the what's the I guess the aim to like you know like should the aim be a comprehensive win tomorrow night? Yeah, I mean, obviously that would be the, the dream scenario that we play similar, create the same amount of chances, but then put them away and get, and get a lot of goals in there. But like I said, we need to be humble and realize it's a completely new game and New Zealand's probably going to learn from, from the first game as well. In terms of playing top nations or middle-ranked nations or low-ranked nations, it, it's all about doing what we want to do, but setting our own standards, no matter who we, we play against. And you also need to have variation in the scheduling. I said that as well. You need to play as many unique opponents as possible with different tactics, different physical approach. And then also when you look at a calendar over a year, it's also about availability. Uh, as you know now, there's a lot of World Cup qualifiers going on in terms of who's available in different windows. When do we want to play in Australia? Who's available and ready to come to Australia and play? When do we play in Europe? Who's available when we play teams in, in Europe? So there's a lot of scheduling going on there. And, and that's actually an approach we've had the last couple of weeks here or last month is to be better in scheduling in advance. So already now we're talking about the February window of, of um, 23 because the windows in, in September, October, November, November is almost locked in already. Follow up question, Marco? Sorry, say that again. Who are those games against in September or October or November? I, I, I wish I could say that. I wish I was allowed to talk about that, but I'm not. Uh, that's the federation to decide when that goes public. No worries. All right. Thanks, mate. Thanks very much. Any more questions from the room? Yeah, can I just ask, I mean, how is there any, any out um, that you can talk about? I mean, obviously, you don't want to give too much away, but is there any, anyone that's been struggling or injuries or anything with the lineup looking into Tuesday's game? 
You know what? We always talk about celebrating the small victories, and one of the bigger victories you can have is to have player availability. Um, except Courtney Nevin, who wasn't available from the beginning of the camp, I have 100% availability going into tomorrow. And, um, you know, the Triple SM team, meaning sport science and sports medicine, always do a review of the availability at night, uh, communicate that to us coaches. And, and um, last night we had 100% green on that information, and then we go like, yes, celebrate those small victories. Cause not just for us, but for any team, any league, men's, women's, tournament, Champions League, player availability is the number one success factor for results. It's proven over and over again in a lot of research. So player availability is key. So we invest a lot in sports science and sports medicine to do everything we can to work with the clubs and the players to have them available. So that's actually huge that we have every single player available for tomorrow. And that makes it tough for me to make decisions, both on the starting lineup and also the game changers. Because, you know, if I could, I would play a lot of, a lot of players tomorrow, but all of them can't get on the park, unfortunately.